the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Then through the darkness Your loving kindness Tore through the shadows of my soul The work is finished The end is written Jesus Christ, my living hope Who could imagine so great a mercy What heart could fathom such boundless grace The God of has spoken I am forgiven the King of Kings calls me his own beautiful Savior I'm yours forever Jesus Christ my living hope
Well, good morning, First Baptist. Thank you for joining me this morning. In light of this pandemic, I encourage you to take care and be safe. I have to admit, this is uh, difficult for me. I'm here this morning in our sanctuary and there's no one here, uh, just me and a camera. And I gotta tell you, it's a little bit uncomfortable. I'm used to seeing people look at me and sort of engage. So this is quite, uh, uh, quite uh, different uh, in doing this. But these are difficult times and these are challenging times. And, and so I'm trying to uh, adapt to the, uh, to the new norm and to, uh, and to present to you um, some encouraging word uh, this morning as we um, continue to, uh, uh, to pray and, uh, and support those around us um, who are struggling with this uh, just terrible, terrible um, pandemic. So before I start this morning, I'd like to uh, just, let's bow our heads um, and pray. Now, if you're driving, I encourage you to not bow your head. Uh, that wouldn't be safe. Or if you're cooking, I would encourage you to not bow your head. But if you're in a quiet place this morning where you can, can sit and, uh, and join with me as we uh, commit uh, this time to the Lord. Dear loving God, I just thank you so much for your goodness. Right now in our world, we are dealing with so much, uh, so much hurt, uh, pain, and, and fear. And I pray God that you'd come and you would reveal the truth of yourself at this time. I pray, God, you would work in a mighty way as you continue to uh, lead us and, and, and bless us and keep us. For, God, I pray you would pour out your love on us. I pray you would help us, Lord God, to find your peace, uh, the peace that you give. Thank you for the doctors and the nurses and, and all those who are working in the hospitals or who are treating and helping those who are, who are diagnosed with this, uh, with this virus. Lord God, I pray that you would work in a powerful way. You would restore, you would heal, you would protect, you would guide us. Father God, you are the great healer, you're the great physician. You are sovereign in all things, Lord God, and we wanna just lift you high in the midst of chaos, of uncertainty, Lord God, we wanna lift you high. We wanna praise your name. We wanna say, Lord God, come, move. Lead us, God. Heal our hearts. Comfort our hearts at this time. Many, Father God, are, are fearful. Many are concerned about, um, about their loved ones, about uh, what's going on. And I pray, God, that uh, the truth of you will be revealed. Your love will be revealed in a mighty way. Thank you, God, for being in our midst, even in a time of crisis. Thank you for being our God. Thank you for your peace, Lord God, and we pray for your continual hand, your love, and your blessing on us. Help us, God, to trust in you in these difficult times. We give all this to you. In your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Philip Yancey uh, wrote a book titled, Where is God When It Hurts? This was his way of, uh, of helping us to understand pain and suffering and making Jesus the focal point of, that, uh, of our pain and our suffering. So, but this morning I want to rephrase that question. I want to give a different twist to it. I want to ask the question, and many people are asking this question today, where is the church when it hurts. Where is the church when it hurts? How does the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, affect how the Christian church lives in times of uncertainty? It's been said we are called to be the hands and feet of Jesus. How do we then show love, care, and compassion in these challenging times. Particularly, particularly in the context of this uh, current pandemic, I believe the church is called to show love and compassion. 
because we have been shown grace and mercy by our God who loves us, we now have the opportunity to demonstrate God in a tangible, meaningful, significant way. I believe the church was designed by God for such a time like this. In a basic sense, the church is more than just a building. It's a body of believers designed and gifted by God to guide, support, and minister to those in need, both inside and even more important, importantly, those outside the church. The primary work of the church doesn't and shouldn't take place inside the church building. It happens outside the walls of the church. It happens outside in the real world. So how do we demonstrate love and compassion? How does the church demonstrate love and compassion? Where is the church when it hurts? If you have your Bibles, I would love for you to turn with me to Romans chapter 12, verses 9 to 17. Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 17. And it reads, Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. Romans 12, 9, 9 to 17, clearly lays out the imperatives. It's about love in action. Here are four things I took away from this passage that I believe will help us and lead us to a place of demonstrating love at a time like this. Number one, we are called to love. We are called to love. In times of crisis, we can become admitted nasty people when our real response should be love, patient, kindness. I love the word forbearance. Let's be patient. Let's demonstrate love. Let's go above and beyond. Christian love is to be sincere and real without self, without being self-centered. Love hates what is evil and clings to what is, what is good. It seeks the good in others. Love looks for the good in others. Love looks for ways to demonstrate itself. And as Christians, we're called to seek and look for the good in others. Love that focuses on the needs of others first and foremost. Love that is authentic. John 13 verse 34 reads, A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Loving others as God first loved us. This is how our hurting world will know you are a follower 
of Jesus Christ. This is how the church demonstrates love. Where is the church when it hurts? It's demonstrating love. It's reaching out. It's going above and beyond. It's knocking at someone's door and asking, how are you? How can I help you? It's calling a friend. How can I help you? It's reaching out. It's making the effort to go the extra mile to demonstrate Christ. It's going down the street and seeing how your neighbor is doing. That's love. That's love in action. That's what we're called to do. Number two, we are called to honor others above ourselves. Our culture tells us to look out for number one, be number one, be all that you can be. It's about you. You are the most important thing there is. God tells us to honor others above ourselves. Our desire is to pursue what is best for others. What would this world be like if we all do that? If we honor others above ourselves? If we go the extra mile? If we seek to meet the need of others? If we ask the question, how can I help you? What do you need? Honoring others above herself. That's important. That's Christ-like love. That's going above and beyond. That is demonstrating Christ to our hurting world. Philippians 2, chapter 3. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 reads, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Christian love sees others as being worthy, worthy of God's love. That's what we're called to do, to place others above ourselves, to love them, to honor them, to seek them out so we can help. Number three, we're called to be zealous, continually serving the Lord. I know this will sound a, a bit harsh, but there's nothing worse than an indifferent Christian. We should never be lazy or complacent in serving the Lord. The hope we have in Christ should always be a cause for joy. There's nothing worse than a sour Christian who is constantly negative, who is, sees nothing good in anything, who always complains, who's sullen. We're not called to be that way. We're called to be zealous. We're called to be alive. We're called to, 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 to demonstrate, to, to show the world how much we love Christ and He's in us. Let's be alive for God. In this hour of chaos, pandemic, and uncertainty, let your light shine for Him. Yes, we're all dealing with uncertainty, we're all dealing with fear, we all don't know what tomorrow's gonna be like, but today, let's be zealous for the Lord. Let's demonstrate His love. Let's be alive for Him. Let's show the world that we are a light and that Christ is in us. Let's be joyful in hope, faithful in prayer, and patient with each other. Let your zeal for Christ permeate so that others are drawn to you. Let Christ flow through you so others are drawn to you. 
Number four, we are called to share with those in need. Let's create opportunities, not wait for opportunities to come our way. Let's think about how we as a church, as individual, the body of Christ can minister to those around us. It says, let's be hospitable. Reach out to those around you who are in need. Pray about and seek out opportunities. Acts 2 verses 44 to 47 reads, All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The early church, they were together. They shared. They looked for opportunities. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread. They shared with each other. They met in homes. And they shared their possession with each other. Praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. That's what we're called to do. We're called to share. We're called to delight in each other. We're called to be zealous for the Lord. We're called to give. We're called to meet the needs of those around us. We're called to share the love of Jesus Christ with the world that is hurting, with people that are hurting, with people that are looking for hope, with people that are fearful. I love this last sentence, and the Lord added to their number daily. When we reach out, when we demonstrate Christ, when we show love, when we're zealous for the Lord, people are drawn to Jesus Christ. People will see Him in us. When you bless others, you're in turn blessed. And we are called to be a blessing to others. God blessed us not so that we can keep to ourselves all that we have and we hoard things. I, as you uh, all know on the news, um, people have been hoarding stuff. I, I was at the supermarket the other day and, and now they're putting uh, signs up on the shelves. Limit amount of stuff that you can take. Only take two cans of soup, not 12 or more than that. Because people are just hoarding and taking stuff on themselves. And, and Christians, we're not like that. We buy so that we can share with those around us. Not to hoard for ourselves. Where is the church when it hurts? God is full of compassion for us. And He wants us and He wants to develop that same compassion in us. We should be praying and seeking opportunities to minister. We should be asking the Lord, what can I do today? How can I reach out today? How can I love someone today? And when you pray that prayer, God always reveals to us individuals that we can minister to, individuals around us that need that love and compassion. Where's the church when it hurts? The church is out in the real world, ministering, loving, supporting, helping, and looking for opportunities where we can bless those around us. More so than ever, we need to be available. We need to lead by example. If not now, when? I can't tell you what you should do, 
But if you seek God, he will reveal what you should do. Make it a priority to seek God as to how you can minister, how you can help someone, how you can reach out. People are looking for connections. They are open. In this time of crisis, let the church be an example. Be the church that God designed us to be. A caring, compassionate body. I'll close by reading Galatians chapter 6, verse 10. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good. Let's do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. In this hour of darkness, let's shine our light for all to see. Let's shine for Jesus. Let's be a beacon of hope in your family, in your community, in your place of influence. Be the light that shine. Provide hope. Look for opportunities to care, to love, to demonstrate Christ. But we serve a God who cares, who loves, who's sovereign, and who's in control. So I you to join me. Be the church that God designed it to be. To be the hands and feet of those who need support and help at such a time as this. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for, for you. Thank you so much for the church. God, I pray that we will indeed look for opportunities to serve, to love. God, fill us with a zeal that shows and tells others that we love you and that you're in us. God, bless us and keep us, we pray. We ask for your hand of protection and your love. In your holy and precious name we pray. Amen.